Dr. Stephen Hassan, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the important and scary world of cults of personality. I am so excited to dive into this because you are one of the foremost specialists and scholars on this subject. What makes a cult, how you can identify if you yourself are in a cult or family members in a cult and how to also deprogram and treat those who are recovering from the abuses and toxicity of cults. So I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here. I want to dive right in. Please introduce yourself, tell everybody who you are, why you're qualified. And also I want to hear about your background with cults. Thanks, Aaron. I really in enjoyed talking with you, uh, interviewing you for my podcast, The In Influence Continuum. Um, and very briefly, I grew up in a middle class uh, conservative Jewish family in Flushing, Queens, New York. Uh, in, uh, I was born in 54 and um, was a nerd. I was a book reader. I wrote poetry. I played basketball. I liked girls. I was in college writing poetry and short stories. And my story is that my girlfriend abruptly dumped me and I was feeling blue and I was in the college cafeteria, Queens College, and three women pretending to be students flirted with me, asked to sit at my table, said they were students, they weren't, and it turned out they were recruiters for Sun Myung Moon's uh, political religious cult that goes by hundreds of different names. A lot of people know it by the Unification Church, but it actually mostly operates these days under many other names. The biggest name is Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, run by Moon's wife, because he passed away in 2012. And then he has two sons in the United States who have cults here. And the, the prominent one is called the Rod of Iron Ministries.org. And it's a cult of the AR-15, where he says <laughs> from Revelation, the Rod of Iron is an AR-15, and we need <laughs> AR-15s to worship God. And conveniently, his brother Justin has a gun factory that makes AR-15s car arms and and other um, pistols and they have two training compounds in any case um i i was recruited into the cult in 74 i really wasn't looking to join a group or change my faith and i spent 27 months in the cult uh i was given uh, a new identity i was told my past was evil and satanic. I didn't believe in Satan growing up, but I became obsessed with Satan and demons because we were taken to see the Exorcist movie as Moonies. And then Moon himself gave a lecture about how God made the Exorcist movie. And this was a prophecy of what would happen to us. And I was honestly believing it for, for many more months. I got out uh, because I was sleeping three to four hours a night, every single night, working seven days a week for no money, uh, recruiting people, doing political things, uh, fasting for Nixon during Watergate was one of them, fasting in front of the United Nations for seven days when they were voting on whether or not to remove troops from South Korea for human rights violations. And in my story, I fell asleep at the wheel of a fundraising van in Baltimore, Maryland, and woke up as I was smashing into the back of a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour, which led to several weeks in the hospital and a badly fractured leg. And I was away from the cult and sleeping and eating for two weeks and led me to call my sister, which was kind of a violation of what I had been told. That led to my sister saying, I love you. I miss you. I come home. You have a nephew you haven't met. I wasn't having any doubts about the group because I was taught to do thought stopping. And I had these phobias. And I really had a new identity as a Mooney, as the son of the true parents and the Messiah, the sinless man. 
anyway, it led to my deprogramming uh, due to my desire to prove to my family I wasn't brainwashed and I wasn't a cult, not because I had any doubts consciously. And then when I was being taught about Chinese communist brainwashing techniques from the 50s, uh, dissonance was heavily introduced because they were Satan and we were God. And, and yet the ex-moonies who were part of my deprogramming team were like, but we were doing the same thing as the communists. What do you think about that? And then that was a biggie. And then the, the final thing that broke the camel's back, so to speak, uh, Darren, was them handing me one of Moon's speeches and saying, uh, read this and tell us what you think, which is the heart of my whole technique that I teach people is ask a respectful question with curiosity and empower people to think for themselves. It's like really the... The, the most power, not try to persuade with facts or argue, but engage the person in the thinking process. They handed me this speech, and it was a, a speech by the Moonies, uh, printed by the Moonies. Moon was talking to congressmen and senators saying how surprised he was that any American could imagine that he, Reverend Moon, a Korean, could brainwash American youth because he respects americans so much and he's sure that no american would be so foolish as to be brainwashed him and for the first time in two and a half years darren i was like what a liar and as soon as i had that critical thought it was like a house of cards falling because he, he was lying, which meant he wasn't being truthful because I had heard him at least a hundred times in person saying how pathetic Americans were and how superior the Koreans were and how he even had to brainwash because our brains were so dirty and and on and on and on. So, But as soon as I, I had that thought, he's a liar, then I said he's not trustworthy. That means he can't be a representative of God. What am I doing? Like, what? And I cried and I was ashamed and embarrassed and broken. And you had talked previously about more, uh, religious trauma. Man, did I have religious trauma. And I wanted to understand what happened to me. How did I believe these things? How did I believe the Holocaust was justified? How did I believe democracy was satanic? Yeah, how how could I have turned into this right wing fascist when it was completely contrary? How could I throw out my original poetry that was the focus of my creativity and my self identity? How could I throw that out because they wanted me to prove my faith and obedience to the group? So I started reading about brainwashing and mind control, and then I started contacting former military intelligence people because I wanted them to hear my experience. And Robert J. Lifton, the man whose book was used in my deprogramming, basically said, come and meet with me. And he looked me in the eye. He said, you know, I only know the step second hand, but you've lived it. They did it to you and you did it to other people. And what you're describing is so much more sophisticated than what I studied in the 50s. You should study psychology and explain it to people like me. And I'll never forget that moment in, in, in mental health. It's called a therapeutic reframe <laughs> or tur turning lemons into lemonade. Here is this Yale psychiatrist telling me, you know, I'm a, an embarrassed college dropout with a cast on, from my toes to my groin and shamed. And he's telling me I could teach him stuff. And I like the light bulb went on. But honestly, I never imagined I'd be doing this for 47 years and becoming a mental health professional and authoring four books, doing a, a second master's and a doctorate on undue influence on the law, which I finished in, at the end of 2020, because I realized the law needed to have, be updated to understand what we now know about social psychology and hypnosis. Um, 
And so here I am, I have a, a Freedom of Mind Resource Center, and I have courses on my website, and I do a blog and interviews, and I'm just trying to educate people that this is a worldwide epidemic, and the cure is education and understanding, you know, what it is, how it works, and how to undo it. I uh, find it absolutely incredible so much of this resonates with uh not only my own past experience with cults but even in just mainstream mainline types of religions sound hearing some of these practices for instance you had talked about the heartbreak of uh breaking up with your girlfriend in college and then the three girls flirting with you yeah now when I was trained in evangelism in seminary, we were told about the five D's of somebody's life that makes them more prone to converting. I don't remember what all the D's were. I remember death and divorce, probably depression is probably one of them as well. Um, is that something that you were also trained by the cult to identify if people are in, in crisis or in a hardship in their life and to pray on that? It's a very good question. My recollection, honestly, is no, not explicitly. We were put in pairs with older members and told to model them. What I remember in the Moonies was being told to identify people as thinkers, feelers, doers, or believers by asking them questions and then tuning our approach to what would be most effective for them. For example, if they were a feeler, we would be talking about love. We would talk mm. about how the we, we want to create a world of love where people are brothers and sisters and how we are people from all over the world living together and 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 so and love bombing was a technique that was named as a technique effusive praise and flattery oh you're so smart you're so handsome you're this you're that you're a leader you know god needs leaders etc if someone is very spiritual then you do talk, god talk if someone's intellectual you talk about the um, nobel laureates and the science conferences of the moonies or if someone's a doer, you know, who, who's got a plan for fixing the world? We do. You know, there's so many major problems we can. Mo so it's about engaging people. But what I also want to say to you, Darren, is in my research for my doctoral uh, dissertation, I used the model by a law professor, Alan Shefflin, who I met in the late 70s when I read his book called The Mind Manipulators about the CIA and MK Ultra, And anyway, he's a law professor. He created a social influence model that expert witnesses can use with judges and juries. And he says, you look at the influencee and their unique vulnerabilities. You look at the influencer or the predator or the predatory organization. And then you look at the who, what, when, where, and how, which includes my bite model of techniques to exploit the vulnerabilities in the person, whether they, their parents an alcoholic or there was a divorce or they broke up in a relationship, et cetera. But it's a framing. Um, and what's happened in the last 10 years, especially, is things have gone online. So a lot of the mind control techniques we were using in in-person recruiting is now being done online with AI and with specific baited um, techniques to nudge people to join certain groups or to watch certain videos that would radicalize them on the left or the right. So there's, there's a, a, a shifting and, and one other thing I wanted to say, Darren, is that my work involves everything from a cult of personality, a one-on-one -on -one cult with a malignant narcissist, which turns out to be the stereotypical profile of a cult leader or a predator, 
uh, to um, large group awareness trainings, multi-level marketing groups, therapy cults, business cults, trafficking, um, and and even nation state mind control cults, and of course, religious cults. So there's many different features, but I think of it all as, you know, different sub categories of undue influence. So talk to me about the undue influence and specifically uh, the bite model that you have created, uh, what bite stands for, and maybe some of the characteristics that happens to unduly influence somebody. Sure. I learned about Leon Festinger's cognitive dissonance model. He wrote a very famous book called When Prophecies Fail about a UFO cult. And his he and his students studied and wanted to understand how when the flying saucer didn't take people away and the world wasn't destroyed, how could they believe more? Uh, how come they just didn't walk away and get disillusioned? So we talked about how humans want to have congruency between their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And when there's a dissonance, we tend to, if we do an extreme behavior, we rationalize more. And we feel like we need to, to justify it more. So I took thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, which is also the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. And I started reorganizing my whole experience in the Moonies to what kinds of things are behavior control. So I went like, well, I was sleep deprived. Uh, I was isolated. I, you know, I, there, there was a, a, a code of conduct, of rigid rules and regulations. So, so I started writing a laundry list of behavior control, which were all, the summary was be obedient, be a blindly obedient to behavior control. Then thought control, well, it's us versus them thinking, black and white, uh, good versus evil. Uh, I was taught thought stopping techniques, um, you know, crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to heaven, peace on earth, glory to heaven, peace on earth, rather than entertain a doubt or a dissonant thought. Then I, I used Lifton's loaded language criteria because Lifton in his 1961 book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, said a mind control group has these, these cliched sayings that stop thinking it's just like fake news you know don't don't think about it it's just wrong whatever so i talked about thought control through language and i'll mention scientology has a whole dictionary of their own definitions of words and members are taught if they don't agree with something that they don't understand the words, so they have to look it up and indoctrinate themselves. And that's a major reason why ex-Scientologists take so long to really recover from getting out of that particular cult. So anyway, I did thought control, then emotional control. Well, they make you feel special. You're the chosen, you're the elite. So a lot of love bombing and uplifting, but a lot of it's about shame and guilt and fear. And what I identified, and it took me about four years after I got out of the group when I started studying psychology formally to learn about phobias. And we learn about phobias as a mental health professional, but no one was thinking, oh, you can install a phobia deliberately in order to control someone's mind, a la exorcist movie, for example, in my case. And what happens in the mind of a mind control member <clears throat> is they can't imagine leaving and being happy and fulfilled. Uh, and I often use elevator phobia as a case example, because someone who has an elevator phobia can't imagine riding safely and comfortably. They can only generate a movie of plummeting to their death or being trapped for eternity. So the, the notion of how people are in these mind control groups where they're emotionally stuck and they can't think and reason their way out of it but then it was like there's something else missing and then i added the information control because i never would have gotten in if they had been honest if they had given me informed consent i would have said i'm not interested 
but they lied. They lied. They withheld information. They distorted information. And then they did extensive propaganda. They also alienated me from any uh, TV, radio, newspaper, magazine, any ex-members. So there's a whole list of, of information control variables. So when I wrote my book in 1988, Darren, I had the four criteria. And the BITE model, Darren, is best understood in the context of my influence continuum, because people need to be able to sort ethical influence to unethical influence. Because the truth is, is we're always being influenced and we're always influencing others. But how do you tell a healthy group or cult? And I do think that there are healthy cults where you know what you're involved with, you choose it, you spend your time, you spend your money. I like I'm I just got back from scuba diving. Like I love scuba diving. For me, this is a religious experience to be under the waves and I pay money, you know, and get in all this gear and all to take the risks and everything else because the experience is so precious for me. But nobody's making me do it. Nobody's using guilt or fear or phobias. In fact, the whole thing with scuba diving training is teaching you to expect what would go wrong and how to protect yourself. So it's it's the opposite of authoritarian mind control, making a pseudo identity that's dependent and obedient and undercutting your true self and your own thoughts and feelings and, and needs and wishes. So, and that's another point I want to make for you and your listeners is that there's a category in the APA, the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the number is 300.15, in fact, that names mind control and cults and brainwashing and coercive persuasion. And it talks about a disruption in identity. And lastly, I'll say, Darren, my work is with two primary populations. One is people born and raised in authoritarian cults, and the other population are people like myself who was deceptively recruited later in life. I was 19 uh, and then got out, but are st still trying to recover from all the trauma that was done to them. And so um, there are very specialized techniques that I found work and, and, and what unfortunately the mental health system is not educated. No one gets training on this in any social work program or clinical psychology program. And it, it really is working with a dissociative disorder and teaching people to be in their body, to be in the here and now, to understand how to discern what's ethical and what's unethical, what's a fact, what's true, and what's a lie, <laughs> or what was withheld from you. And to have that anchoring with you, an internal locus of control, because when you're in an authoritarian group, you're always deferring to some outside authority figure or outside ideology instead of your own trusting your own gut and your own critical thinking and then lastly to be future oriented to to know that life's a journey and our job is to help grow, ourselves grow and learn and be a better person tomorrow and next year than we are today and contribute to others because that is ultimately very fulfilling to do things that matter, that is helping others in some way, shape, or form. I want to return back to a few of the influence techniques that people do to each other and also do to themselves. And then I would like to explore more specific techniques that you talked about with helping people recover or even deprogram out of these things. Sure. The thing that really strikes me is the thought stopping and cliches that kind of come with it. So I would love to hear other examples of thought stopping, but I want to focus real quickly on the cliches. We hear cliches a lot among 
religious believers of all stripes. And I'm wondering, is are these types of cliches examples of thought stopping? For instance, somebody says, well, God works in mysterious ways, or let go and let God, or everything happens for a reason. Are those examples of thought stopping or not exactly? Not exactly the way I understand it, Darren, is that those are examples of what Lifton called loaded language. And he cited Lionel Trilling in his 61 book that Trilling called them thought uh, terminating cliches. So there is a thought stopping element to loaded language. But when I use the term thought stopping, it's more of a behavior mod technique. And I should say on the influence continuum, an ethical therapist can teach people how to interrupt a negative thought, like I'm stupid, or nobody likes me, or I'm ugly, or whatever, to learn to stop the thought and say a positive thought, then I'm learning and I'm growing. And and uh, life's going to get better tomorrow. And one can literally behaviorally intervene with one's own mind and change your emotional state from keeping you depressed to starting to have a future where you can imagine being better. Thought stopping on the authoritarian destructive end is a technique, and it's many different techniques. So it could be uh, well, I in the Moonies, we were taught to chant internally, crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to heaven, peace on earth, uh, sing a holy song, um, uh, do an audible prayer uh, to to tell, you know, to kick Satan and evil spirits out, etc. cetera. Um, and um, basically thought stopping shuts down doubt because you're like this isn't fit or he lied or he made a prophecy and it didn't well you have to get rid of that thought because it's impure and you label it you think it's evil or something like that but you're doing a very behavior mod type of technique um, and i should also add there's emotion stopping that's a parallel technique mm -hmm. to thought stopping where you're feeling homesick, but you're not allowed to go home because you're out on the missionary field or you want sleep, <laughs> you know, your, your body's craving sleep and you're like, that's selfish. And, and, and so you shut down that feeling or, you know, you feel like the leader's being abusive of you and then blaming you for, for what's happening and not taking any ownership over what they're doing. So there's there's a number of techniques, but the key thing that I wanna share for you and your listeners is this notion of the real self and the, and the pseudo self. And when I'm asked, you know, how do we know there's a real self or an authentic self? I'm just talking for, uh, as, as an experienced liver of life and as a therapist, but as far as I know, there's no scientific validation that we have an authentic self, except we know when we're being true to ourselves in a very visceral, you know, more than just an intellectualized way, when when we're being, you know, in our body and being true to ourselves. And one technique I was taught by one of my teachers is to ask this valuable question, when do you feel the most you? And often when you ask someone who is in a cult that question, they have no idea what you're talking about at first. They're like, huh? And then you say, well, stop and think about it. For some people, they're playing guitar. They're, for other people, they're dancing. Other people, they're surfing. Other people, they're reading a book. Other people that are out in nature, they're playing with children. So you give them some prime, prime primers for examples. And then they're like, come to think of it when I am X. And that becomes an anchor point for their authentic self. 
because when people are born in cults, they're like, Steve, I don't know who I am. I just know all the stuff that I grew up with. I haven't a clue. And some mm. people are gay and they don't, they, they haven't had permission to know that that's okay. Like that's a human condition that's valid in and of itself. It's not a mental illness, <laughs> but they don't, they don't have the words or the framework to go, oh, when I'm attracted to someone, that's okay. And, and plus heterosexual sex, you've been mostly in religious cults taught that that's unnatural and evil, you know, masturbation is evil, sexual attraction is evil, it certainly wasn't the Moonies. But um, to know this is, we're biological beings. <laughs> we have, our bodies are wired to react to stimuli and to have needs. So it, it's, it sounds very much like the, those who are brainwashed, and I apologize for just using kind of the cliche with that, those that are brainwashed are absorbing the identity of the leader exactly. or identity of the group and losing their own exactly that's, so let me ask, that's what i believe well you had mentioned chanting as uh one form of thought stopping and it immediately one of the things that popped in my head are things like speaking in tongues that that's I another used to one do. a lot of the thought stopping behaviors that you had mentioned and and the emotion stopping behaviors as well sound very self-inflicted it's somebody doing it to themselves are there examples of the group or the leaders in the group doing the thought stopping for the other person as well or doing it to somebody sure but it's a, it all depends on a number of variables like uh, were you very young when you got in or or not but typically, people are being influenced by the leader, but they're also being influenced by their peers and everybody else. And in a lot of destructive cults, people are paired up with older members or buddies who are monitors who want to help the person be okay and learn the right way to behave. And they're teaching these techniques to people. Um, speaking in tongues, chanting, praying, uh, meditating, like in TM, people are taught never to have a negative thought or feeling. So they have to meditate and emotions tell us things. I say to my clients, emotions are our friends. We should listen to them. We shouldn't be controlled by them, but neither should we be isolated and, and not listen at all to our friends. <laughs> Like they, they help us navigate this thing called life. Something that has come out of Leon Festinger's work, kind of building upon it with the assumption that he was hinting at this, at least, if not explicitly coming out and saying this very thing, that things like evangelism, proselytizing for your religious group. And I think of just regular uh, I'm out there with uh, a cross and, uh, and handing out Bibles to Mormons going on mission, um, that the act itself, the proselytizing act, really isn't fully intended to actually gain converts, but rather to self-indoctrinate and to I continue. Agree. Okay. Absolutely, 100%. It's it's about and I, I I what comes into my mind is uh, Daryl Bem's self perception theory, which is something I learned in the seventies. But th where we learn more about what we're experiencing inside by what we're doing on the outside. So hearing ourselves telling people this is the truth, this is God, we're telling it to ourselves. And so there's that, you know, and, and the more you ask someone to do a behavior that's uncomfortable, uh, and especially for introverts, it's incredibly painful to send them out on street corners and talk to strangers for hours and hours and hours, right? And they're usually not successful at getting people in where extroverts are, but then they're fruitful. And, 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 you know, they get promoted because they're getting more converts, 
um and uh but definitely a hundred percent um it's 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 the it's they want to get people recruiting as soon as possible and one last thing when i recruited my first two converts was when i can look back and say i consciously stopped doubting interesting and 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 i remember being told now you're a spiritual parent and their spiritual lives are in your hands so you need to be a very very pure role model for them of faithfulness and commitment and obedience and that you know again that was something that 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 got me deeper into the the cult wow interesting you know uh you talk also about one of the dominant characteristics of a cult is the in-group, out-group, us versus them and the isolating of people. Um, it seems like the act of proselytizing and evangelizing helps solidify that as well. Eliminates your doubts, but also pits you against a non-believing world. Is that well, I, I would just say it eliminates the doubts from the cult identity and keeps them subterranean in your real right. identity is how I would conceptualize that. Interesting. When I, when I got deprogrammed and I allowed myself to doubt, I had all these memories of doubts that mm. in real in real life, any one of them would have made me run out of the group. But they had all, they've been registered, but they all got filed subconsciously until we could open the door and then, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. So, well, so talk to me about the deprogramming or uh, maybe capitalizing on some of that doubt in order to regenerate critical thinking. You had mentioned before that one technique you did for yourself and then you encourage others to do is you read a speech, you read something, you said, what do you think about this? Dive into that a little bit more for me and maybe some of the other real practical techniques you can do. Sure. And I'm curious, if you are having people read something, what do you have them read? Is it supposed to be something that con you know to be contradictory? to their beliefs no i don't recommend that well so let me just say that the term deprogramming originated in the early 70s and it was involving holding people against their will keeping them away from the cult and kind of content drilling them on how bad the group is I really didn't work very well, except what worked is keeping them away from the group and exposing them to former members who were not like drooling at the mouth and with horns coming out <laughs> of their head, who were happy that they were out of the group. Um, but it's evolved over time to voluntary interventions. And what I do now, I call the strategic interactive approach that relies on educating family members, friends, former members, and others to um, understand the dual identity of the dissociative disorder, to understand the influence continuum, the bite model. And the idea with my approach is empowering the real self. You can approach the cult self and try to bring contradictory things up, but my approach is more focused on empowering people to think for themselves and make their own decisions. And um, the, the, the biggest mistake people make is they attack the leader, the doctrine, or the policy head on, which is guaranteed to elicit the cult identity to be defensive and to feel persecuted and to distance from you because you're attacking what they hold so dear. What's far more effective is sharing stories about another cult or about Chinese communist brainwashing techniques or about pimps and traffickers or any number of other mind control cults. Uh, Heaven's Gate, I like to show the videos of the people before they died where they're, people say we're in a cult. 
but this is the wisest decision we've ever made. And I'm not joking that that's how they look. And I've yet to yeah. show people that video of the exit video and have people say anything, but man, are they brainwashed. But once they can go, that's brainwashing, then I can explain the bite model. I can explain the influence continuum, talk about how they were given a new name. They were isolated from their family. They had new clothing and just got sleep deprived, et cetera, and go through all of those things. And once they understand as a case example of real brainwashing or mind control, then the rest is asking people to share their experiences. Tell me, in the years you've been in the group, you must have a lot of friends. Oh, yes, I've had many friends. Tell me, after 10 years, has anyone ever left? Oh, sure. Oh, so pick one person that you particularly liked. When they left, I'm curious, did you go and talk with them and ask them why they left? Oh, no, why would I do that? Well, because they were your friend, you were a comrade. Uh, aren't you curious? Oh no, people leave because of Satan, or people leave. You know, they they go they go through all the litany of things, and they say, "Yeah, but you're a smart person. You know how to evaluate what's true and what's not true. Why not ask the person directly and see what they say? Because you might be surprised, or it might validate." that you know it's a mistake to ever leave the group etc but the idea is to open the door once people get that you know people in scientology can't talk to former members they're told they have to disconnect that they're evil you know and to understand that's information control in order to do mind control once they make that parallel then you can you can encourage people to take a time out and why not um, talk to critics? Why not learn the Bible and, and, and go into, uh, as you were in your work of uh, falsification, why not look for alternative, you know, approaches to explain a certain phenomenon and see what holds water. So the whole idea of my approach is really, um, not saying I'm right, you're wrong, I'm going to fix you. It's, hey, we're human beings. We're all doing the best we know how. Let me share my Mooney story with you. Let me share some videos of other things. I'd like to teach you about social psychology. I'll, I'll share a video of the Ash Conformity Study, the Milgram Obedience Study, the Zimbardo Prison Study. Those three are ones that I use all the time. And very briefly, the Ash Conformity Study. Are you familiar with that one? I'm not. So Solomon Ash, this was in the 50s. He would create a what he told the, the, the testees is a visual perception experiment. But it was a study in conformity. He'd get 10 people in a room, show them a placard, with a, 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 a sample size line, let's say it's three inches, and then have three other sample lines, a three inch, four inch, and five inch. And everyone was in on the experiment except the person in seat six. And they'd give the correct answer twice, and then they'd all start with confidence giving the wrong same answer. And he, he wanted to know how many people, even though they could see with their own eyes, would start to give the wrong answer just to fit in because it was emotionally so uncomfortable. And the answer is about two thirds of everybody. And this has been replicated for decades around the world. Two thirds start giving the wrong answer. And some people give it emphatically, like, of mm. course, the five inch line is the three inch line. Come on. It's obvious, wow. right? And nobody gets up and measures the damned lines, which is what <laughs> I want my students to do, to realize you may be in a situation, you're given these choices. What are the other choices for you to reality test? So anyway, that's the Ash Conformity Study. The Milgram Obedience Study was a phony shock machine. Milgram was a, a child of a Holocaust survivor. 
and he wanted to see would Americans kill another person because an authority figure ordered them to. And so he hired this high school professor to moonlight and wear a lab coat. And he created this phony shock machine, two thirds electrocuted. And there was no electricity, but it sounded like electricity. And it sounded like someone, it's a tape recording, screaming out in pain, my heart, my heart, I don't want to get out of the two thirds would kill another person in an hour because they agreed to do a, a scientific experiment. And a guy said they no, had no other choice which means only a third are what we call heroic resistors until they learn social psychology. Then the number goes way up because people now understand, aha, this could be an experiment or, you know, I need to put myself in the other person's shoes and say, if I was having pain and I wanted to stop, would I want to be released? Would I want someone to come in? Or I want someone to call 911. And then the Zimbardo prison study had healthy young people randomly divided into prisoners and guards. And a two week experiment had to be called off after six days because prisoners were having, having nervous breakdowns and some of the guards were getting sadistic and, and controlling and manipulative. So I, I try to teach truths that are non-threatening to educate the person and empower them to realize, hey, life's precious. And yes, I know you believe these things. I believe fervently that Moon was the greatest man in human history until I realized he was a liar and a cheat and he was having sex with, you know, endless female disciples and gambling and, you know, mm. et cetera. It sounds like at the core of it, of the techniques is to, allow room and give the opportunity for somebody to for the light bulb to go off for themselves for them to discover what's going on for themselves rather than force them into discovering it thousand percent and realize people got in in a process and to not think you can do this in an hour and mm. it's about a relationship building of respect curiosity being open uh, and and uh, finding common ground, um, asking questions, but there are specific techniques. So there are two dimensions here, helping people realize the group they're in is not healthy, and then the recovery. Mm. So for me, my deprogramming got me through the realizing I don't want to be in this group anymore. But then there were years of therapy trying to get my head back together and piece things back together. It took me a year before I could kiss a woman without hearing the indoctrination in my mind about Satan. You know, it took me a year before I could start writing poetry again. Um, and, and, but I was only in two and a half years. I mean, it was intense, but I have clients who've been in their whole lives in groups. Wow. So it's a longer process. The good news is that we learn and the human mind wants to heal and, and people want the truth and they want to love real love, not conditional love. We'll love you. If you stay in the group, we'll love you. If you continue to agree to believe what we believe, but to actually, we love you for your beingness because you're a cool person. And I like you, even though I don't agree ideologically with you on this or this or this that's healthy humanity. Well, thank you so much for that. In the two minutes that we have left, uh, you teach these things. You have your own course. They are also accredited. You can get CEUs with your courses. So tell people, uh, how can they get in touch with you? How can they learn more about cults and cult techniques? And also, more importantly, how to help people, the techniques to help people who are recovering or still are in cults. So briefly, Combating Cult Mind Control is the updated book of the 1988 book. Um, and I think that's a great place to start. Freedom of Mind book is on how to help people to reevaluate their beliefs. It's about my approach. I did, my latest book is called The Cult of Trump, about all the authoritarian cults that are directing their people to think that he's a great leader and trustworthy and God's choice. 
Um, so that's that. In terms of the courses, I have a recovery from Mormonism uh, video series from a workshop I taught in Utah with a former sixth generation uh, Mormon psychologist, John Dolin. And I have a course, one for clinicians with CEs, and I have one for the rest of the public. It's less expensive, basically the same material, but um, it's going to help empower people to understand what happened to them and uh, recover. And on on social media, I'm at Cult Expert, and we have a, a, a free newsletter, email newsletter. You can sign up at freedomofmind.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. S. And this was absolutely enlightening and wonderful. And thank you for what you're doing to bring healing to a really broken world. So it means the absolute world to us at GCRR mm -hmm. to be able to partner with somebody like you. So and I want to partner with you. And I want to thank you for all of your incredible work. And I want to learn from you and take your course. So I think there's a lot of interesting things that can come out of this friendship. Agreed. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan, and I want to shed light on the insidious workings of cults and mind control. Cults manipulate vulnerable individuals, exploiting their deepest desires for belonging and purpose. Through coercive tactics and thought reform techniques, they strip away critical thinking, replacing it with a dangerous conformity. In this process, the autonomy of the individual is shattered, leaving them trapped in a web of control. But it doesn't stop there. The reach of mind control extends far beyond the walls of traditional cults. The rise of online communities like QAnon has shown us how easily people can be swayed by distorted narratives and conspiracy theories. Groups like the cult at Sarah Lawrence College and Nexium remind us that even intelligent, educated people can fall victim to the allure of a charismatic leader. So I implore you to join me in this fight. Take action to raise awareness about the dangers of mind control and groupthink. Engage in open dialogue, challenging the narratives that seek to manipulate and divide us. Educate yourself and others arming yourself with the tools to recognize and resist manipulation. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.